itself placed stars and signs in the heavens and the atmosphere. The Jewish people later formed their calendar on astronomical observations and the sighting of the new moon every month from Jerusalem. But, very interestingly, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, calls a series of feasts in the book of Leviticus a moed, M-O-E-D. And these are appointed times that God deals with people on the earth or the Jewish people themselves. In Leviticus 23, the father tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's got a calendar and he's got appointments on them. And he sums them up, there are seven appointments. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, there's first fruits, there's Pentecost, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Feast of Atonement, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel's feast days have to do with the phases of the moon. Some of the feasts will be started on the new moon. So the moon is extremely important in the feast days. As a matter of fact, Passover has to have a full moon. The feast days are highly related to apocalyptic events, to the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation or the apocalypse without understanding the feast days. The book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast of the Lord. All those things that we were to rehearse that the scriptures speak of uh, from Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, day of shouting uh, through Yom Kippur and the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles. It is all there embedded in there and it's all in the book of the Revelation. Right. The Creator runs the universe according to His time clock. Whether we recognize it, live by it, understand it or not, makes no difference to Him. Right. The next feast that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, and then after that, the Feast of Atonement, and then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. Amos. An eclipse is when one body goes in the shadow of another, or one body blocks out all a part of another. So an eclipse of the sun is when the moon goes between us and the sun. An eclipse of the moon is when the moon goes into the shadow of the earth. And these things happen uh, five or six times a year. They're very ordinary. God said he created the sun and the moon for signs. What greater sign could that have meant but solar and lunar eclipses? While eclipses are natural phenomena, what gives them prophetic significance is when they happen on the biblical calendar right. and when we look scientifically at the patterns of when they have occurred historically. And back in 2014 and 2015, I originally discovered that there were these four total lunar eclipses falling on the biblical holy days, two right. years in a row, back to back. So I did research to find out when was the last time this happened. And I noticed the last time it happened was 1967 when Israel recaptured Jerusalem. Hello, these are very prophetically significant. And then the time before that was right after they became a nation in 1948. And then the time before that was 1492 when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain because of the Spanish Inquisition. Right. So all I did was connect the dots between NASA, when the eclipses occur, with the biblical calendar, and then it comes to, okay, what is the prophetic meaning? The blood red moon is not uncommon in itself, but they are uncommon when they fall on feast days exactly, especially in tetrads, having four of them within a span of a year or two. I think the celestial events are kind of like parables. Jesus taught parables and he hid truths in those parables. Right. I think that's the exact same thing with celestial events. Right. Just as if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says the bridge is out, it better not be where the bridge is out. It better be a mile ahead to give you warning. So right. for me, these signs in the heavens were warning us about what is coming over the next several years. Right. The Great American Eclipse is something that is fairly rare. We are going to see a total solar eclipse in August of 2017 come across America from the state of Washington to the state of Georgia. The total eclipse is going to be amazing. It's going to be the 
first time in decades that we've had a total eclipse that's visible over most of the continental United States. Total eclipses happen fairly regularly on the Earth. I mean, every other year, approximately, there's going to be a total eclipse somewhere on the Earth. But, you know, most of the Earth is water. A lot of the Earth is not very well populated. This is the first event in most people's lifetimes where it's visible to millions of people. Almost anyone in the United States could drive and within a day be on the path of totality. So this is a big deal. Every culture for thousands of years I was in had LBL whenever that, that eclipse as a warning from God or from the heavens. Well, what you have to do is look at the pattern. In 763 BC, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is today currently Mosul. It was a very ungodly area, it was pagan, and he was told to go and bring him to repentance. And Nona balked at that, didn't want to go, and rebelled, and went the opposite way. After he is swallowed by what the Bible says is a great fish, he is vomited back up on the beach, and he now goes to Nineveh. And when he finally goes there, the entire city repents, the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes, including the king. There was a big plague that affected the entire city of Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the king couldn't even go out to war in the spring, as kings normally do. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. And then, in that summer, you have this total solar eclipse that goes over Nineveh. So all the Ninevites... They are scared to death, having had a plague, a civil war, another plague, and now this total solar eclipse. Nineveh is recorded to have had the Burr Sagal eclipse of 763 BC. The thing that may have made Nineveh repent uh, could have been that total solar eclipse. Jonah arrives on the biblical calendar the first day of Elul. Now that is going to be around September 1st. And in the Bible, that month is known as the month of repentance. Now what many people don't realize, this warning was a 40-day warning. Well, that leads you to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is also the Day of Judgment when God judges the nations. Right. And so here we have, on August 21st of 2017, a total solar eclipse that just so happens to occur on the first of Elul, the very beginning of the month of repentance that is leading up to the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This has to be more than coincidence. The sun, as far as a total solar eclipse, refers to judgment coming upon the nations. When was the last time we had a total solar eclipse that completely crossed the United States. Did you know it was at the end of World War I? And here we have America involved in World War I. Many people don't realize World War I also began with a total solar eclipse that went all through Eastern Europe through Turkey, and even went all the way through Nineveh. And what do we see happened? The Ottoman Empire is destroyed, and the solar eclipse went right through the Ottoman Empire. Right. So we see a pattern of judgment. Interestingly enough, Jesus said that a generation towards the end, asking about the end of time, Jesus said they will be given the sign of Jonah. Maybe it's talking about an eclipse. And if that's the case, then America needs to take warning. Right. There are some people who just don't listen to reason. Eclipses repeat more or less on the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates and the Moon goes around the Earth every 18 years, 11 and a third days. A third of a day um, gives the Earth a third of a turn. Uh, so the, each eclipse is in that series, which is called the Saros, is a little further north, a little further south than the last one. And by the time you're through with three or four hundred years, the Earth's surface is covered with the paths of eclipses, 
We just happen to be in the middle of this one, which is fun for us, but there's nothing really special about it except that we happen to live here. You know, people in history have been afraid of eclipses and thought they sort of, yeah, were foreboding uh, signs of, of things to, to come. And that's where science is helping us. I mean, we're not afraid of eclipses anymore, at least most people aren't. We understand what they are. Um, it's just a simple geometrical alignment. Is it? Is it? I think one of the things that's happening with the Great American Eclipse is that there's something following it. Right. On September 23rd of 2017, there is an alignment that is happening in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the constellations, which looks like something that John wrote about in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. In the first two verses, he's talking about the sun, the moon, the stars, the wandering stars, which we call planets, and a constellation, which is Virgo. John says that he sees a great sign in heaven, that there is a woman, she is clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet, and she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. But she's also pregnant, but not just pregnant, she's in labor and about to give birth. We know that Virgo would be the woman. The moon will actually be at her feet. Uh, the sun will traverse by back her shoulder, clothing her in the sun. And in her head will be 12 stars. Nine of those will be the constellation of Leo. It makes up Leo. They're always there. But the three other ones that are not there are the syzygy, the alignment of planets. Mercury will align. We'll have Venus that's there and also Mars, making up the 12 stars. And we can see that the 12 constellations around the ecliptic only has one woman in it that the sun, the moon, and the wandering stars can travel through. And that would be Virgo. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant. Now how can a sign in heaven be pregnant? There's another planet that is right now being in what we would call the womb of Virgo for several months. And it will exit that womb due to what's called retrograde motion, which is going back and forth on September 23rd. What happened in November of 2016, the planet Jupiter moves into the birthing canal in the constellation of this woman. And it stays there for a period of close to 42 weeks, which is a human gestation period. And it doesn't exit until the sign is finished on September 23rd, 2017. If Virgo is pregnant with Jupiter, and it's nine months to deliver, exactly nine months, then the question is, what happened exactly nine months before September 23rd? So the UN Resolution 2334 passed in December of 2016, censuring Israel for having any type of developments, any type of settlements in the 1967 borders. And that has caused a major firestorm. Those settlements are in those areas that are contested by the Palestinians. That censuring has really given the world a stance against Israel. The UN seems to have resolution after resolution against Israel, the tiny nation that's only the size of Connecticut. And I think you're seeing an anti-Semitism. One of the things that I've noticed is that every time you see anti-Semitism grow in the world, whether it's 1917, whether it's 1939, you usually see a world war. When we see this occurrence of Jupiter going into the womb of, of Virgo, that does happen every 11 years. It's not rare. We know the moon's at her feet once a year, so that's not rare. Uh, what we do see is very rare are these three planets lining up in Leo. As they come in again, this makes this occurrence once every 7,000 years. That is extremely rare. I actually took the time I went back 6,000 years and I took screenshots of every single time that the woman was clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet. Because again, that happens every year. But do you have her giving birth? And do you have 12 stars at her head? There's never been a day that the exact same thing that happens in 2017 has ever happened. I also went 1,000 years into the future. It's just not there. This is the year that it seems that John saw right down the line, every single thing that's going to happen on September 23rd, factually, is mentioned in a book that's 2,000 years old. 
This is what Revelation 12 is talking about. And so it's a time marker. This is starting to happen now. And I think if the people are right about this, and I find the evidence rather compelling uh, that they are, I believe we can expect to see some significant activity on or around September 23rd. It's like I tell people, your world can change very quickly. Shock and awe for real. It's very interesting that this Revelation 12 sign, it aligns at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. The alignment will be obscured because the sun will be there. It's happening in the daytime. How is this sign going to be seen? How is it going to be observed? It can be observed by astronomical programs, but it's going to be observed very likely by people. Is there any scenario that can allow us to see this alignment in the middle of the day? There are a couple things that have been postulated. One of them was some type of dust that would come from a volcano that still would obscure that sky so you wouldn't see it. It would darken the sky, but it would obscure it. The other one is that some type of cosmic occurrence could come and cause the sun to be darkened. We know it can't be an eclipse because the moon's on, the, on her feet, so we know that. So it would have to be another, another body, another object coming and obscuring the sun. And that would have to enter outside of our solar system. The only way this can happen is the last part of Revelation 12, 1 through 5, starting in Revelation 12, verse 3, you have the appearance of the red dragon. In Revelation chapter 12, it also talks about a great red dragon. It talks about that dragon ready to consume that child once it's delivered. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was cut up to God into his throne. On September 23, 2017, this very highly unusual once-in-an-era alignment can be seen in visible light by the naked eye if Planet X eclipses the sun during that morning. In Revelation 12, 1, 2, there's an object called the Red Dragon. And this Red Dragon is the Planet X system. I've seen pictures of it before they were blacked out on the sky view. It's a picture that looks like two eyes or two objects, two planets, with a series of smaller satellites around it. It's a very frightening picture. Planet X is a planetary body that has crossed Earth's inner solar system before and caused great havoc in the past and is coming back soon again sometime in the near future people have known about it for years it's been in popular science magazines as far back as the 1950 stories about planet x the real hunt for planet x was the launch of the space probes in the 1970s and the launch of the iris satellite in 1983 this is an infrared satellite that was doing sky mapping in the infrared range in 1983. And this absolutely located it and gave definition to it. It was major news on the front cover of US News and World Report. It was in the New York Times, the Washington Post. It was a big story, but nobody paid much attention to it. It has a straight elliptical orbit and has come through and it crosses Earth path twice. That gives us three fixed points center of the sun where it pivots from and two crossings on earth path which is roughly five months apart it's not going to collide with the earth but parts of its asteroid belt and so forth will collide with the earth well a third of the stars thrown down by the dragon's tail is an asteroid debris field behind this object can affect electromagnetically 
anything that approaches. And a lot of people are saying, why do we have global warming? And they blame it on all kinds of things, hairsprays, fuel emissions. Is Planet X the cause of our climate change? I would say yes, without a doubt. It's affecting our sun. The sun is tilted by extra six degrees. Earth is tilted extra four degrees. Our magnetic north is moving at 12 times its normal rate. We have some anomalies that car mystic exhaust fumes cannot explain. That doesn't change the magnetic north of Earth. Only another magnetic field can. And that would be another planet. This is a huge system, and it will be passing 10, 12 million miles close to the Earth. It will block the sun, and it will light up the nighttime sky. And this once in a era, dramatic set of circumstances will be visible for the Earth's people, will be visible for the Earth's TV cameras, and it will be a fulfillment of the last great sign in the book of the Apocalypse. Remember, in ancient times, they didn't have the word planet or comet or any of these modern terms. The most common term in, throughout Asia is fiery dragon of old. Planetary science is the study of all things planets. Everything that happens inside a planet, the planetary motion around this host star, even to some extent what inhabits the surface. My sub-discipline within the broader umbrella of planetary science is kind of astrophysics, so the study of planetary orbits, how do they interact with each other, how do planetary systems form and evolve. My name is Konstantin Batygin, Assistant Professor of Planetary Science at Caltech. And I'm perhaps most widely known for the Planet Nine hypothesis, the idea and the, the kind of theoretical calculations that uh, essentially prove the existence of an additional massive body that orbits the Sun on a much more elongated and extended orbit than the typical planets of our solar system. Planet Nine is a planet about 10 times more massive than the Earth itself that resides so far from the Sun. It still orbits the Sun, but its orbit is so big that it takes 20,000 years to go around. We have legitimate data to really support the notion that it's indeed there are patterns that can only be explained by the existence of an additional planet. If you go to the outer reaches of the solar system, the most distant orbits that we know of, they all swing out into the same overall direction. And that's telling us something, that there is a gravitational pull that is acting to sort of shepherd these little bodies that we observe. The question then is, where is this gravitational pull coming from? And using relatively sophisticated mathematical models of the solar system's evolution, and the gravitational pulls among all of these bodies, we can demonstrate that this clustering of orbits, this alignment of the distant bodies, is indicative of the existence of an additional planet in the solar system. And using their orbits, we can calculate the orbit of the planet. Planet Nine is exceptionally dim. Backyard telescopes, no matter how big, cannot spot Planet Nine. It is what we call technically a magnitude 24 star, which is just astronomy talk for really, 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 really dim. So we need the largest telescopes on Earth, even to just spot some of the light that's been reflected off of its surface back onto the Earth. We may discover this hypothesized planet this fall. We're hoping to, actually. And if we find it, though, it's going to be a thousand astronomical units away. We may find it this fall, but it's not coming to, to get us or anything like that. Planet Nine is there looking for something that's also perturbing our outer planets. But it has a large orbit that's outside our present solar system. Well, that's not what I'm looking at, and that's not what's been misrecorded. 
we have another smaller body with much smaller orbit, roughly 360 year orbit uh, coming in and out. That's roughly about 90 to 94 astronomical units out. We're looking at two different objects. To the best of my understanding, and really my understanding is quite basic uh, on this uh, conspiracy theory, if you will, Nibiru is supposed to be an ob a planet that's on a really eccentric orbit, um, right, that crosses the orbit of the Earth or something like that. Uh, and it's, a, long story short, it's supposed to destroy uh, all life on Earth, as I understand it. This would be a pretty bright star in the night sky. It would be visible to your backyard telescope. Probably be visible to the naked eye. Why have more people not seen the Planet X system on a visible or astronomical basis? This object is in the infrared range, and only in unusual atmospheric conditions are you going to see it. This is why so many of the professional telescopes, the Vatican owns, Mount Graham, Arizona, these are infrared telescopes. The South Pole Telescope, big question is, why do we even have one down there? Why not just put another telescope in Chile? The answer is, it's the best location for visibly sighting it in the infrared range for visibly tracking it. Will there be a warning uh, before Planet X arrives? Yeah, we'll probably give a 40-day warning to the public. Each country will warn its own people in their own language. Remember where it says in the Bible, it says, for a wicked and adulterous generation, there'll be only one sign, and that's the sign of Jonah. I take that to mean the 40 days of warning that Jonah gave to Nineveh. This is when Planet X is just rounding the sun, and we can see it from where Earth is at the time. We have visual sighting of it then at 40 days. The model works out with that comment. That's exactly what Jonah was showing to Nineveh. Somehow that suggested that the dragon could be Planet X, Nibiru, Planet Nine. I'm skeptical about that, even though I won't throw out any possibilities. It's named Planet X because it won't get a name until somebody actually observes it, so it's never been observed. Today we're seeing some people look at Revelation chapter 12 when the Bible talks about 12 stars and it talks about a red dragon, those type of things. As I look at Revelation 12, and as you really just read it in its natural element, you'll see that really what the author is talking about there is he's retelling the history of Israel. And obviously, the 12 stars would refer to Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel. The red dragon refers to Satan. Those things are pretty much explained in the passage itself. Uh, and I think one of the, the cautions we must have in biblical prophecy and looking at the signs is that sometimes people go out into the world, they see things that are happening or about to happen, then they retroactively apply those things to Scripture. I think that commits an error of reading things into the Bible instead of seeing the Bible for what it's actually saying and then going out in the world and saying, are those things really happening? Planet X, or Nibiru, has been read into the Scriptures. It's not literally there, and it's not physically there. People are looking for a natural reason why the events transpire in the book of the Revelation. Planet X is just the imagination of people that uh, has fallen so far um, on the ground. It, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, any evidence of this that has been found in the real physical world. I appreciate the poetry of Nostradamus. I appreciate the people that have written about 2012 in the Mayan calendar, but this is absolutely no comparison whatsoever. This is not Hollywood anymore, this is reality. This is where astronomy and the Bible meet. Planet X is the calling card. It creates all of the anomalies, all of the atmospheric conditions, all of the asteroid impacts. It creates over 90% of the problems in the book of the apocalypse. Planet X, the destroyer, is the destroyer. If a big object crosses the Earth's orbit at a safe distance, then nothing happens. If a big object crosses the Earth's orbit at an unsafe distance, 
then the Earth gets ejected from the solar system, right? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be still be orbiting the sun. The gravitational kick that we get from a body like that would be absolutely detrimental to our orbit. And as a consequence, we know that this has not happened because we're still here. It also just makes no sense from the point of view of, gee, the solar system has lasted four and a half billion years and something that plows through the solar system every orbit would have disrupted that, right? Let, let's ignore that for a second. It's just its immediate effects would be visible. It's just not there. It isn't true that planet-changing catastrophe is part of the Book of Revelation. We do a disservice to antiquity because we don't really understand what they were saying and we allow ourselves the indulgence of imagining that they thought about these things the way we did, that they coded them into their traditions and their beliefs as if this is just carried forward. Well, I think that is an underestimation of people's imagination and, in fact, the solidity of their cultural traditions. People who are on the move today to look for this kind of thing will seek sources that they can exploit to bolster the argument, which is ultimately, in, in their minds, just another catastrophe coming. Well, it seems to be a much more reasonable catastrophe if somebody in the past also said it. Now, for most people, it's relatively harmless entertainment. But there are folks out there who are afraid for their kids, school teachers who are wondering what to do. They don't know necessarily how to make a judgment about this. And I think the purveyors of this kind of nonsense ought to take some responsibility for the fear that they unnecessarily instill in otherwise perfectly normal and friendly people. Something that's very interesting about the year 2017 is that it seems to fulfill a number of different generational numbers in the scriptures. The Hebrew date of 5777 is the year 2017. That number seven is significant in scripture. All numbers in scripture have significance and symbolism. Seven is the perfect number. It's the number of God. It's the number that uh, we associate with perfection. A triple seven is just like a triple six, 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 which is the number of men, number of evil. Uh, in triad form, it reemphasizes the perfection of God. If we look at 2017 as year zero, and we look at Israel and what's been happening to Israel years ago to come back into her land, it seems to have started 120 years ago. A man named Theodore Herzl held a congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, in which at the end of the conference he wrote in his notes that he founded the Jewish state. If Theodore Herzl founded the Jewish state in 1897, the next step that took place was the Balfour Declaration. This happened in 1917. And then the next thing that happened was that the UN General Assembly decided to vote, and they voted to create the State of Israel. That was in 1947. Then the Jews started coming back in their land. There was a war in 1948, which is called the War of Independence. They got their land, and they declared themselves a state. In 1967, there was another war of which the Jews took back their capital, which they didn't have in 1947 or 48. But you've got everything landing on a 7, 1897, 1917, 1947, 1967, and a jubilee, which is a special 50-year period to the Jews, from 1967 lands us in 2017, of which there are two epic signs in the heavens, which are declaring, possibly, the return of the Messiah. 120 years, 100 years, 70 years, 50 years. And year zero then could only be, counting this way, 2017 would be the beginning of the apocalypse. But what happens on September 23rd, 2017? We can only speculate, and we have to be careful. 
Personally, I found that I cannot find anything better that would paint the picture that we read in Revelation 12. September 23rd. Okay, what's going to happen? Probably the same stuff as September 22nd and September 24th. Daily current events. Now, I can't say nothing big will happen. I mean, it's possible that Trump will do something and North Korean dictator will do something. You know, of course, but these things could happen any day. I personally don't get all bent around the axle on dates and times and this, that, and the other thing. Even though I look at things and I analyze them and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this could happen now, this could happen then, uh, I'm prepared for the long haul. And so if nothing happens, good. <laughs> you know, that, that's more time where I can plant my garden and, and play with my grandkids and things like that. If something happens, good. We're getting this party started. We tend to assign a lot of meanings to the motion of stars as they appear on our night sky. It's the wrong thing to do. If we were to view whatever alignment that we see on our night sky, from, say from Mars, on exactly the same day, it would be totally different. It wouldn't be there. Things that are kind of moving around in a complicated way might appear as if they're lining up, but in reality they're just going about their regular trek. If nothing took place, I, I just don't see that happening. I can't see that happening. I believe it's mathematically impossible. I, I don't believe in coincidence. The beginning of the end is 2017. The beginning of the end is on and after September 23rd, 2017. The end time messianic age is upon us. The confirmation of the covenant, watch, this fall, will be the day of trumpets. It was a privilege to serve you. And it will be an honor to die by your side in the service of the King of Kings. I have daughters and I have grandchildren. And before going, I'm going to make sure that they understand that this is something that I feel that I need to do. And I'm going to be leaving them instructions on what to do should this all take place. Most people in the world, they don't want to see it happen. And most people are going to keep their eyes closed and pretend nothing is going to happen. And when it does, they too will be in a little bit of shock. These things were prophesied 2,000 years ago. They're coming to pass now, and now they're seeing it happen. So hopefully I put it in context for them so that they will know what to do. I think we miss the fact of signs. I think when we look at a sign, we have somebody who wants to write a book and say, this is what's going to happen on that because this sign happened. I think the message of the sign is really kind of to alert us. Again, as Jesus taught in parables, he hid truths there. Can we just pass it off and say it means nothing? I think even a skeptic cannot pass it off and say it means nothing. I'm not so sure I'm interested in what specifically is going to happen. What's going to happen is going to happen. God has his time frame and he knows what he's going to do. What I'm more interested in is seeing America, seeing people wake up and seeing people say, hey, let me throw off any of my preconceived notions. Let me look at the science behind this and the spiritual aspect of this and see if I'm personally ready for whatever's going to happen. Could this be the year? This could be the year.
most amazing stuff. I'm talking 500, 600 carats. Oh, they weren't gonna make it back from Venezuela. They got something big. Freddy does have a gift. He always has. Anastasia done. I can cut our rough to match. You talked without my knowledge. People will line up to buy a piece of history. Don't whatever you say. Leave. Now! The business burned down. Kids busy with lives of their own. Brother-in-law like a parasite. You haven't been late in God knows how long. What are you doing? I'm fine. This is Hydra. It's the promised land of pot. Badass. I know you're a drug dealer. I'm just getting started. It's a good beer. Talk fast. It's the I am so, so sorry. Boring. No, look me in the eye. Did you know that she wanted back in? This is your divorce, Jen. It's all legal and everything. There's no uh, little threads left between you two. And proposing to Jack's friends. Yes, I'm happy that you are. It is. What? I'm pregnant. Jack! Or what is? The Holocaust diamond. It puts green and green right back on top. Green and green. Green and green, yeah. Right. Feel better. Hey, so we got a full This season, the cast is phenomenal. Fans of the show are going to see a deepening of all of the characters, certainly a deepening of the relationship between the brothers. At the beginning of the season, they lose everything, so they have to start over. Lady Ra, who's a character that everybody loves to hate, plays a much bigger role this season than she did last year. You may think that you know L.A. She's a great villain. But I am L.A. Ray Winstone, who plays Cam, is sort of like the godfather, like an old-school criminal. Business is booming. Guns are dying. And I've been looking to kill somebody all day. Ava, who started the season as one of the characters' ex-wives, is now a main tenant of the show. Single woman now um, making it on her own and sort of building her own life around her and her daughter. Ready? Action! I'm sorry. Aren't you tired of saying that, Jake? What? I half expected you wouldn't come. We have a couple of new characters in season two, and we introduced Ava's mother, who's played by Amy Madigan, phenomenal actor. It's been ten years, Ava. It's time I get to see my granddaughter again. And we have a character named Reardon, played by D.B. Sweeney. You know, if you ever do get out, I can be your sponsor. When you first meet my character, the audience is not aware of who he is and what his resources are. And he's very cunning and will do anything he needs to do to get what he wants. You have one job. Get me some real answers. Tessa Pryor on behalf of my client, Frederick Green. Now what the hell are you doing here? Let's just say you have a, a friend, Mr. Green. We also introduced Laura Vandervoort as a bit of a love interest for Jake. Can I get your card? Finally. I was starting to think you weren't going to man up. In casting Jocelyn Hudon, we were able to sort of age the girl a little bit so we could do some more adult stories with her. You don't check in. You're late. After everything we've been through, Willow. And have a bit more conflict with the mother. Can you please just leave me alone? Come on, Willow, talk to me. There's also a character, Braxton, who's her love interest. I spent all six periods thinking about how to introduce myself. What did you decide on? Who ends up being a really sort of shady character. You gotta go. It's an amazing acting pool. We have an, a brilliant casting director. Can you want to do one more time? Yeah. Go ahead. They're adventurous. They're ready to go every day. It's just been an amazing experience with the cast. And it's 